It's the Real News Network. I'm Sharmini Pires coming to you from Baltimore. The Office of National Statistics in the UK has reported highest levels of employment since comparable records first began in 1971, with 75.3% of the people aged between 16 and 64 in some form of work. However, this apparently positive news betrays a far darker experience for millions of people living in the UK. The construction industry is contracting. Inflation in the UK is the highest out of the world's top economies, according to the OECD. The British households have the highest household deficit recorded in over a century. So much of the increase in employment appears to be in precarious and non-secure jobs. And at least 10,000 people have died or committed suicide due to changes and cuts to social security systems since 2011. Joining us today to discuss the UK economy and Labour Party's proposals that were recently outlined by the Labour leader Jeremy Corbyn is Michael Roberts. Michael has been working in financial services in the City of London for over 30 years and is the author of several books including The Great Recession and The Long Depression. He has a blog providing Marxist views on economics at the world economy at thenextrecession.worldpress.com. Thanks for joining us today, Michael. Good afternoon. So, Michael, I know uh, uh, this is a tall order to ask you just right off the bat, but can you give us a brief overview of the state of the UK economy and how things are going, particularly in relation to these numbers in terms of employment? Yes, well, like other top economies, since the Great Recession ended in 2009, economic growth and a recovery from that deep recession that we saw now nearly uh, nine years ago has been very gradual indeed. Around about 2% growth in the UK economy in real terms, that's after inflation each year. About the same as has happened in, in the United States as well. But in the last year, things have really deteriorated. After the vote for so-called Brexit vote, the referendum over a year ago, um, when the British people voted narrowly to decide to leave the European Union, there's been a significant decline now in the growth rates uh, and now the UK is growing the slowest of the top seven economies in the world. Uh, although employment seems to be very strong and as you say seems to be at the highest level we've seen since records began, actually as you point out it's not the case for a whole layer of people. Many people are working part-time Many people are working on quite low wages uh, jobs without much skill prospects or promotion. And above all, a huge number of people are now self-employed. In other words, they can't find proper jobs, so they've tried to set up their own companies, one-person companies trying to sell an, a service or some, or some commodity or do taxing or whatever it is in order to try and make a living. And these people are earning way less than they did before when they had a proper job. So there's a, there's a whole layer of people also who have only got jobs based on on call, what we call zero hours contracts. They have no contract. They're on call from the employer at any time of day or night to go and work, say, one or two hours to make a bit of money. Hardly anything in which uh, to live upon. There's two million of those in the UK now. So there's a whole layer of people uh, who are in, as you say, precarious employment and often in and out of any sort of paid work at all, apart from many people who have just given up trying to look for a job. So it's not as great as the figures show. What we have in the UK, and this is a really interesting fact, high employment, but the falling real wages. The UK, of the top seven countries, uh, major economies, has the biggest fall in real wages uh, compared to anywhere else. And in fact, real wages are still below where they were 10 years ago in the UK. It, the Bank of England reported that this decline in real wages is the worst and longest period for average workers in the UK for 160 years. That tells you how difficult it has become for the average person to make a living and make ends meet. 
Now, Michael, give us a sense of uh, what's causing this kind of fractionalized, disjointed um, uh, work environment for so many people. Well, I think the main reason is that uh, the owners of, of the big businesses in the UK, both foreign and those owned by the British, ha have uh, concentrated on just employing cheap labour. There's been a lot of immigration from the European Union of young people and others just to fill in cheap jobs, particularly in our public sector services like uh, teaching and hospitals and so on. And there hasn't really been any attempt to raise the skill level of the population or to introduce a lot of investment in new uh, uh, technology and in new businesses that could provide extra jobs around the country so that the British industry could start competing on the world. In fact, British industry business investment in the UK is flat and it's at the lowest level as a share of GDP compared to all the other, most of the other countries in the European Union and most of the other top seven uh, economies. So it's very weak business investment. There, if you like, you could describe a business in the UK as being on strike as far as investment and providing skilled work is concerned. If you compare Germany, for example, huge amounts of apprenticeship schemes where workers sit on councils of companies and ensure that workers get proper skills and decent conditions. So those sort of conditions, those sort of uh, organizational, that, that sort of apprenticeship and training just does not exist in the UK. So people stay in low wages and with little prospect of getting better skills and opportunities for themselves or their families. Right. Now, um, Labour leader Jeremy Corbyn has proposed nationalising utilities and public banking. Uh, does this seem to be something that the Labour Party should fight for and advocate for? And would these uh, proposals actually change the working conditions uh, for people in the UK? Well, I think it's very important uh, step forward that the, the new leadership in the Labour Party, which has only been in position for the last two years and did reasonably well in the last snap general election we had earlier this year, uh, should propose these measures because there is a clear failure on the part of these of major utilities. You think about it in the in the US, you're thinking of your water, you're thinking of your electricity, you're thinking of your gas. Uh, you're thinking of your transport system, particularly in the case of the UK, the railway systems. All these have become either broken to bits when there used to be one integrated system in the case of transport, or run completely by private monopolies. Uh, people complain about the state controlling an industry, but here we just have one company controlling water, controlling electricity, controlling gas and making huge profits out of it. Uh, and, the own, and the managers of those companies are massive, grotesque salaries, and yet they're not investing to provide decent uh, sewage and water management or electricity and gas. And above all, the prices in these uh, utilities is very, very high. And we have, for example, in transport uh, in the UK, the highest prices for transport, whether it's rail, bus or metro, in the whole of Europe. And this situation is a real squeeze on the living stands of ordinary people and totally inefficient. So the measure of returning to public ownership these utilities and the railways so that they run efficiently with some measure of accountability and democratic control in the interests of the taxpayer and, and the people uh, in, their, in the street would be a tremendous step forward. So from that point of view, it's a big, big uh, gain, I think, if that's achieved, if Labour comes to office to do that. And does the conditions exist in the UK to make this kind of transition? Um, we spoke with Leo Panich um, uh, here at The Real News about Corbyn's proposals. And he clearly said these are not socialist proposals. They are a good start. Um, do you think Corbyn's proposals go far enough to tackle the problems uh, within the UK economy? And if so, are the conditions uh, there for him to be able to make these kinds of transitions? These measures will be a big step forward if they're implemented by a Labour government in the future. Things like making sure that our universal health service, we call it the National Health Service, is operating in the interests of taxpayers and the people working in it and the patients and not just for the being leached on by the profitable companies which are 
leaking out that system and reducing it, all these measures will be a, tr a tremendous step forward. And they're not very radical. Uh, they're very modest measures to restore our transport system, our utilities, our hospitals, and a national education service, which he's proposing. All that's very modest, and I can't see how anybody could really oppose it. But interestingly, such modest proposals are now very difficult to get through uh, the powers that be, uh, the capital, uh, big business, and the City of London, who oppose them all the way down the line, and the Conservative government too. Maybe 40, 30, 40 years ago, such measures were regarded as pretty modest and were uh, standard, really, in many countries, particularly in Europe, but even in the, in the US. Now, to return to such what used to be called a social democratic or welfare state is regarded as really radical. That shows how bad things have deteriorated for the, for the average person. So it's going to be a major struggle if we have a Corbyn Labour government, say in the next year or two or three, uh, that attempts to implement that. It will be a major struggle to get that through and there will be tremendous opposition by the media, by international capital, not just the City of London and the banks here, uh, and also, down the road, the real problem, I think, is that will the British economy not suffer as uh, big business and capital tries to take its money abroad and cause an economic crisis? Robert, the UK has been you know, privatising a lot of uh, its corporations, its previously public health entities and uh, so forth, like many other European and Western developed countries. So um, there's been a long history since Margaret Thatcher days. Now, in order to undo this now, and if the Labour Party and Corbyn is successful in uh, beginning to turn this over, and you say these aren't radical proposals, um, uh, how likely is it that he's going to be able to achieve such a such a uh, uh, tall order at this point? Because there isn't uh, much public appetite, as you said, in the corporate sector or within the international capital to let this happen. How how hard will it be? Well, it, it could be hard, but there are two things in his favour. First of all, there may not be any support uh, for these measures, which, as I say, are modest and used to exist 30 or 40 years ago before we had what were so-called neoliberal counter-reforms by the likes of Reagan and Thatcher and so on. Uh, these are very modest proposals, and they may well be opposed by the City of London and big business, but there's a lot of public support. The mass of the public supports that. Recent polls have shown, for example, that 70 to 80 percent of people ask are in favour of bringing back into public ownership the water utilities, the electricity utilities, the gas utilities, and that there's massive support for getting the profit motive and the market out of our universal care system, the National Health Service. 90% of people are in favour of, of making sure that that happens. And there's even up to 50% of people asked are in favour of taking over the major banks in, in the UK, which have been shown to have been totally rotten and unfit for serve, uh, purpose over the over the period of the last 10 years, uh, speculating in derivatives and all kinds of other exotic and dangerous, uh, what Warren Buffett used to call financial weapons of mass destruction, rather than providing a public service in loans and deposits for households and businesses. These measures that uh, Corbyn and the Labour Party are advocating uh, have massive public support. And that's always a powerful weapon against the uh, desires and motives of just big business and, and the elite. And as long as we have a parliamentary democracy in the UK, then, and Labour has a majority in Parliament to carry these things through, then they can and will be implemented. Michael, there's so much more to discuss when it comes to Corbyn. Um, let's take that up another time. I thank you so much for joining us today. Thank you very much. And thank you for joining us here on The Real News Network.